Hello, you multi. Uh, meticulous, methodic, methodical, malt mentioner. And thank you to Sashid Media for that malt mention. I'm Ralphie in the Bothy, somewhere, not anywhere, but somewhere in the middle of the Irish Sea, somewhere in Northern Europe. Um, the, the home of long nights in the winter and long days in the summer. And I've just reviewed this rare breed wild turkey bourbon as part of Ralphie Review 901. And here in 901 Extras, I'm going to take on the theme a little bit further of American bourbons by giving you a brief personal history that I've had with two bourbons that I have in my collection. Um, they're both very interesting. They both have an awful lot in common, but they're also both very, very different. So here's the first one. Single cask Blanton's bourbon. Uh, so just to give you the specific specifics of it, this bourbon whiskey was dumped, they call it dumped, um, on the 3rd of the 1st, 2012. So in fact, the 1st of March 2012. And it's from barrel number 237, or 8, it's a bit blotchy. And um, it's Rick on Rick number 10. And it's been bottled at 51.5%. So there we go. That gives you the provenance of this. And I've had that bottle since about 2012. And as you can see by the fill level, there's an awful lot of it left. Whereas this bottle, oh, clink of glasses. This bottle, which was bought roughly the same time, is heading towards empty. Uh, this is a bottle of Elmer T. Lee single barrel um, sour mash bottled at 45% and I have absolutely been loving this. I've been loving it, really enjoying it. It's one of these whiskies you don't rush. It's a bourbon whisky. You don't rush it, you take your time and it's a traditional sour mash and these two bottlings are very closely related in fact they come from basically the same stable. Um, but <clears throat> there's a huge difference in terms of flavour. Apparently Blanst Blanton's is quite hard to find now because it's become a collector's item. And I have to say, all you collectors, cheers, I know you're probably not going to taste this, so I'll taste it for you and tell you what you've bought. You've bought a rather bland, uneventful, unadventurous, disappointing bourbon. I'm just giving an opinion. Um, it's only an opinion. Don't get upset. Big deep breath now. Considering this is basically cask strength, 51.5%, even the nose is light. This comes across as a wheat bourbon. Sure, it's been well made. It's got flavour. Of course, it's all whiskies have flavour. But is there anything particularly exciting about it? Slightly peppery, a little bit sandalwood note, come from white oak, vanilla, and custard. Custard. I'll show, I'll show you what kind of custard. This kind of custard. Instant custard. This is a packet of flavoured sweetened corn flour that you whisk into hot milk and it turns into corn flour custard. The flavour of vanilla is immediate and it's kind of rather synthetic. This is the primary note, this instant custard, is what I'm getting from the Blantons. And this is, this is a good version of Blantons. 
I like some water. It's nice enough. Custard, brulee, soft ginger, vanilla, icing sugar for baking cakes. In fact, it has got a flavour of instant cake mix. It's just an opinion. It's only an opinion. I'm being honest with you. It would be so easy for me to see if I can get a few more views by sitting going, ah, Blanton's absolute classic, wonderful, absolutely defining moment in the modern history of American bourbon. It's so amazing. It's this, it's that, it's complex, it's wonderful, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to bullshit you. I'm giving you an honest opinion. It's what I do in this channel. Frankly, I don't like it. If I was going to give it a mark right now, Seventy-six. Seventy-six. Let's go next door to Elmer T. Lee. These bottles, the unopened bottles, and there's not that many, crop up in auctions in the UK and sell for something like £250. Crazy amount. When I bought this, it was something like £35 a bottle. That's why I bought four bottles. Four. Why would I taste a sour mash bourbon that I'd never seen before and I bought in a hunch and then within two weeks I went back, I went out, I bought two bottles at the shop because that's all they had and then I went online and bought two more and they're in, in my collection, my stash. And it's for drinking by the way. Cheers. Because as soon as you nose this, you are nosing something which is absolutely, I'm not exaggerating, light years ahead of its stablemate in terms of event on the palate and on the nose. It has, quite simply, more sensation range. On the nose, you get more sweet and sour. You get bitter you get dryness, you get just a little bit of, it's just, it smells like an old mom and pop bourbon that you would find under the floorboards of a Midwestern bungalow that's just basically in a state of disrepair and it's been hidden there as a stash. This is the sort of smell I'm getting. And I can relate to this because I've been to one of these whiskey shows where I tried some seriously old bourbons from the 1930s, 40s and 50s. And the, the grain was different in those days. The grain delivered more flavour. One of the big problems for modern bourbons is that due to ultra industrialization of the production of cereals, which is all controlled by cargo. Big, massive company, look them up. Fascinating, fascinating insight into, into American business. But you've got very, very few companies absolutely dominate sugar, corn, and wheat. Three absolute staple ingredients for all junk food. Breakfast cereal, burgers, burger buns, wraps, all the rest of it. And in these mega farms, they are using all the, the technology that science can provide them to increase yield, increase productivity, increase profits. But something gets sacrificed, and one of those components is actual flavour, which is why when Balconis first appeared in the UK market, I immediately bought a bottle of Balconis Blue which was using blue Hopi corn. Very difficult to work with, but the flavour was amazing. It was something absolutely brand new, and inevitably it's tasting these cutting edge whiskies like Stranachan's, McCarthy's, uh, Balcona's, 
these types of distilleries, as in where I can actually get a hold of them in the UK, that this is where my points of reference are found. So to go into a supermarket and buy a bottle of Jim Beam, it's just not going to cut it. I don't waste my money, I don't waste my time. These are these are big brand bourbons and frankly most of them are no use to me. Even four roses have gone off that. This is why I'm this is why I tend to be mentioning the, the wild turkey. This is why I tend to be looking more at Canadian rice and Irish corn whiskies. Because things are just exploding globally at the moment. And this brings me back to Elmer T. Lee. What you have is an old school production of bourbon where a percentage of the mash, previous mash, has been allowed to sour. And as a result, it has added acidity to a fresh wash, wash, fresh mash bill. It's added flavour, it's added complexity in the same way that rum, if you go to the Caribbean, they've got the little pit outside where they put the rum slops and they let it hubble, bubble, toil and trouble and then they scoop out a big bucket of it and shove it in with the molasses or the sugar cane extract and they get more flavour. I say it's exactly what's happening here and I tell you what, Elmer T. Lee, bless him, that man knew his, that man knew his game. He really, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. And my goodness, this is one of the most outstanding, amazing, original, authentic bourbons I have ever come across. And I'm just, you see, th this is why I'm so damn fussy. Because this becomes the point of reference. Not a Jim Beam with an H statement on it. Or a bottle of Jack Daniels, you know, give me a break. I mean, nothing wrong with it if you're wanting a shot glass and you're just going to neck it and then put on your 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 um, your whiskey face, you know, glug it all in the back and go, and then bang the glass down, sunny side up on the counter. All the old Hollywood bollocks cliches that you get. Oh, come on. And um, there's people, I'm sure, still do it. People still do it. Because, you know, some people are daft when they're sober. And they're even more daft when they're no longer sober, and that's just the fact of it. But I tell you what, you, you, you're, you're not going to feel daft buying a bottle of this. Although, I have to add, it's the collectors that have cornered this now. And um, it's, it's become almost a, a commodity, a hedge commodity, like gold, gold eagles and old memorabilia and gas station signs from the 1950s. You know the sort of stuff I mean. Let's examine, go between the noses here. Blanton's Elmer T. Lee. Light, simple, a bit of an effort in the nose to get in and smell it. It's so light. Whoa. Much more resinous, much more complex. The taste. Blanton's. Delicate. I'm being diplomatic. Delicate. It's nice enough. Adding a drop of water, and you've got to add very, very little, by the way. This will hardly take any water at all. Oh, excuse me, I've got a visitor. You coming in, sweetheart? It's all right. Yes. If you caught a mouse or something, well, don't leave it where I'm going to slip on it and fall flat in my face like I did the last time. Cats. Meow. The Elma T. Lee. It's not flavour like in the rare breed where it's coming from rye. The flavour's coming from all the grains in the mixed mash bill. There's more citrus, toffee citrus. There's more mintiness. There's more resinous, rosehip, cherry, 
apricot stone. It's just so much more and I'm going to ask the question here now to all you bourbon fans. Where are all the sour mashes? Where are all the old school sour mashes? Who's making them? What an opportunity for a small US distillery. Just like the small Irish distilleries are rediscovering, recalibrating and reinventing traditional pot still Irish whiskey, combining malted and unmalted barley. In the US, there is wide open to rediscover what Elmer T. Elmer T. Lee was doing these years ago, making amazing, just amazing American whiskey that's truly world class. But you, you can't just go into a shop and buy it now. Because so much of American bourbon is dominated by the corporate multinationals and they just want the volume of sales and the convenience of easy industrialised production. Thank goodness for the new distilleries. It's very, very exciting time for American whiskies because the new distilleries are coming in and they're not afraid, are not afraid to learn fast, make mistakes, learn from the mistakes, get better and better and put out really good stuff. Risk taking rediscovering, reinventing, creating sour mashes. Starting literally with a plastic bucket on the sunny side of your distillery and you put some of the spent lees from your mix, from your last distillation and you leave it for a couple of weeks and, <laughs> and when you start to see the, the vapours rising off it you say right let's put a bucket or two into our next run and just see what we get. Or let's put it into the ferment. Let's see how the yeast deals with it. Let's see what the yeast makes of it. Um, and it doesn't need to be mixed grain bourbon whiskey. It could be single malt whiskey. Because Britain, Scotland's a cold country. So Scotland has never had sour mash single malt. Never. If I had a distillery in Scotland, I'd make it. I'd do it. I'd go for it. I'd make Scottish rye, I'd make Scottish corn whiskey, I'd make the whole run. But unfortunately, Britain's a little bit broken and therefore exploration, innovation and um, recalibration of a, a global business isn't really on the cards. Give it time though, give it time. In the meantime, it's up to the sons and daughters of pioneers in the new world to explore the past, rediscover the past and remake the past with brand new ingredients, brand new attitude, brand new temperament to make these whiskies available out there. Exciting, fresh, different, new flavours and that I'll raise a glass for. Absolutely. You'll notice by the way <laughs> I'm raising a glass of Elmer T. Lee not the Blandons. Thing is, the Blandons is bland. It's just an opinion. It's just an opinion. I'm just giving you an opinion. Cheers. Mm. The rich, syrupy, dry note coming from this is it's highly unusual in modern bourbons and I'm just glad I've got some bottles left because they will last me the rest of my life because they'll have to. But in between, in between time and keeping an eye out, keeping an eye on the USA and Canada and other countries for the reinvention, rediscovery of sour mash protocols and technologies and techniques because I'd be certainly, if I come across a, the right bottle at the right price, I'm certainly more than happy to review it. Bye-bye.